the, the two people I knew it wasn't was Dusty and John. <laughs> so uh, I got asked to uh, talk a little bit about marijuana and, and uh, maybe the impacts in our community. But uh, the, the cool part is for you folks here at Lacey or, or, uh, Chamber is that you have Dusty as a member. And uh, he's very much so uh, informed as I am, so I appreciate you letting me talk about it, Dusty. So um, first off, we know that uh, medicinal marijuana was introduced in 1998. And at the time, um, it was used for, uh, I think the intended purpose was for it to really help people who really needed assistance, uh, uh, like a natural pathway. And through the years, we were noticing that um, it was being used more and more. And uh, what happened is, is that we were seeing that dispensaries were mostly operating illegally. Well, actually they are. And the reason why they were illegal when they first started is, uh, where were they getting their marijuana from? How was it being packaged? And how was it being left at the dispensary? And then on top of that, these dispensaries, what are they doing with the cash that they get? And how do they pay their employees? It's all cash business. And unfortunately, there was no taxes. Uh, most uh, out of all the dispensaries in the state of Washington, I think they said less than 10% of those uh, dispensaries were paying taxes. So what I did it, uh, what wasn't said is that I also sit on what they call the Northwest Ida Board. Ida stands for High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area. And Thurston County is one of 14 counties in the state of Washington. There used to be 17, and then as funding went down, so did the, uh, the funding for the drug units. And we actually have a Thurston County Narcotics Task Force here in uh, Thurston County that's comprised of Lacey, Olympia, Tumwater, Thurston County, a prosecutor from uh, John Tunheim's office. Uh, once in a while, we might get a DEA agent in. Um, and we also work on the assistance of the National Guard. So when we became a HIDA, uh, we were also given extra monies. And those monies were back then to combat meth labs and to deal with higher level drug dealers. That included the level of drug dealers that were selling marijuana to these dispensaries. And the reason why we got on them is because what were they doing with all the monies and it's illegal. So slowly but surely, the federal government has started to lax up on what their enforcement looks like, not only in the state of Washington, but throughout the United States. And a lot of that came because of 9-11. So once 9-11 hit, uh, we were seeing a decline in enforcement. Uh, first off, the FBI quit enforcing marijuana laws. And then we were starting to see that a lot of DEA agents were going uh, to the Middle East uh, to do other programs. So we started seeing a decline in that. But we also recognized in law enforcement that we needed to do something about medicinal marijuana and how does that look. And so um, when I first got to be sheriff, I actually testified that um, if you're going to use it for medicinal purposes, then I don't have issues with a doctor who has way more schooling than I do telling a person what kind of medicines they should or should not have. However, those are for adults, and they're not for children. So in 2012, now I just said that I'm an executive board member with WASPIC, which is a sheriff's or Dan did, but also uh, so is Dusty. And on the board, uh, we all voted, and also did every sheriff and police chief in the state of Washington, <coughs> we voted that we oppose I-502. The reason is, is because in our careers, we usually see what the effects are of what drugs do, including marijuana. And we also reached out to our partners in Colorado who had recently legalized it. And what they discovered is that it's a bigger problem than what anybody could ever imagine, um, especially with youth. And so we came out against it. Now, um, we didn't, we didn't, uh, we're not able to raise money for campaign against I-502. As a matter of that fact, I think I-502 raised about maybe at best $500,000 when you have big businesses coming in and promoting 502 and you have mothers and you have soccer moms 
and teachers saying that it's okay, it's not that bad. Well, if anybody really knew who the voting public was, it's the people in this room. And none of you, well, maybe a couple of you, are under the age of 25. But most of voters are not informed voters on what is, what is good for you and what is not. Um, at this time, when we equate marijuana, most of us, um, we think of marijuana as not being very potent. As a matter of fact, in the 70s, it was equated to 1.5 to 3% THC, the tetrahydrocannabinol that gives you the effect, or the, uh, if you will, the high effect of what marijuana does for you and how it affects you. So it was low levels. Um, I've never met a uh, person who smokes marijuana about three times a week say that he's addicted or she's addicted to marijuana. Um, but they are. Nowadays, um, we are seeing a lot of addiction, and especially amongst our youth. Um, with Haida, um, I was part of a marijuana study throughout the state of Washington. In March 2016, we were presented with the results of what marijuana does, not only to our young adults, and our young adults are age 18 to 25. What we're seeing is that we were seeing a 43% increase just in crashes, crashes on our highways, fatalities. We're seeing a 300% uh, use of abuse amongst our teenagers. We're seeing um, our 10th graders, one in five who uses marijuana or has tried marijuana within the last month. Our, our, also, our Healthy Use Survey said that uh, 12th graders, one in four, use it um, at least once a month. That's a, that's a high rate. And it's because, as a society, we're thinking that it's okay. And unfortunately, it's not okay uh, in the law enforcement world because um, you get a break about your businesses and how great they are. Unfortunately, uh, in law enforcement, we don't get a break about the young kids who are affected by marijuana when we go to those crash scenes and have to tell their parents what happened to their children. Um, and it's because of marijuana use. Um, so a couple things is that uh, there are three different strands of marijuana, first of all. Um, and there's a sativa brand that is a, a, a really a, a tall, uh, leafy uh, marijuana plant um, that um, yields between 14 and 28 percent THC. Uh, you have a hybrid, which is made up of sativa and indica, that brings between 11 and 26 percent uh, THC. And then you have your indica, which is a shorter plant that brings in about uh, 28, between, uh, what is it, 13 and 26 percent THC. So when I say that much percent of THC, and we're saying the highest THC we were seeing in the 70s was 3 percent. So what we're seeing now is, is uh, more of an addiction. So what has the state done since legalizing it? Well, first off, in the medical world, uh, we made it to where you can only have 45 plants and you can have up to six uh, patients. The reason why they did that is because most patients do not know how to grow marijuana. And luckily for me, I've gotten a great education on growing it just because uh, in, um, uh, being in a drug unit, I was in narcotics for about five years, um, we had the largest marijuana grow on the West Coast in uh, 1999, and we seized over 3,700 marijuana plants. <laughs> it was the largest hydroponic grow at that time uh, in the West Coast. So when I talk about the different types of plants, we also talk about how we grow marijuana. So growing marijuana is two ways. You either do it hydroponic or you do dirt grows. So Right here, right now, on the west side, we have 255 uh, producers, we have 246 processors, and we have 108, 128 retailers, just on the western side of Washington State. Eastern side, we have 278 producers, 
We have 214 processors and 43 retailers. So all combined, just last year alone, uh, they were able to grow uh, just over uh, 59,000 pounds of marijuana. So that marijuana brought in about $307 million to the state of Washington. Nationally, right now, marijuana brought in uh, $5.4 billion uh, just in 2015. Uh, right now, the state, the marijuana production that they say, you make more money off it than you would off of Microsoft. So, which I thought was a kind of an interesting statistic. So for those of you uh, who purchase marijuana, it's, uh, you know the price is about $16.32, including tax. If you're gonna buy an infused product or a concentrate product, you're looking at about $65, just over $65. So with the infused uh, products, we're talking about baked goods, desserts, candies, snacks, liquids, and then they have a miscellaneous, which I really don't know what a miscellaneous is, but they say it, it's about 9%. <laughs> so when I say that, I talk about, well, it makes it look easier because um, it is uh, more lucrative for the young, young people to try the candies and the desserts, just like it is for uh, new people to try out marijuana. Uh, they tend to go for the snacks like the brownies. So, but what we are seeing is that in 2014, uh, we had 80% of our youth are the ones who called the poison control line last year, 80%. So that was up from the legalization of 43% before it was legalized, that we're having our youth do that. So what I would say is that in uh, Thurston County, our stats for uh, last year, we, Thurston County Narcotics Task Force took on six marijuana grows. Now one of the big things that people talk about is that, that law enforcement locks up people who use marijuana, who have small amounts of marijuana on you. And that just does not happen to be the truth. And unfortunately it's really hard to fight those really cool ads that say that we put everybody in jail, that's why we have a jail uh, population problem. The truth of the matter is, is that most people who grow marijuana who are, that we take down, we do not take to jail. Um, also, people who are caught smoking marijuana in possession, we do not take to jail. Um, and the reason is, is because it's legal, it's an education system, and it's not why we're here is to put everybody in jail. So the people that we do put in jail are because they're selling multiple pounds. So last year, um, our deputies responded to a call um, where an individual uh, was not taking care of his sheep, and Ruth would appreciate this, is that uh, his sheep uh, was cold out, uh, he hadn't sheared them, they were dragging in the snow and in the ice, and uh, so someone called in an animal complaint saying that they weren't being taken care of. So the deputy did the right thing and gave him a call and said, hey, you need to take care of your sheep. And he reminded the teller that he doesn't have to take care of his sheep. So she ends up going out there to look at the sheep. And then she also gets a veterinarian to come with her because she doesn't know a lot about sheep. And they find out that, yes, in fact, he's not taking care of his sheep. So she gets a warrant to seize the sheep. And lo and behold, she discovers a small amount of marijuana. Well. At the end of this story, we seized over 800 pounds of marijuana. So, now I, what probably most people want to know is, what does marijuana go for? If I said with tax, it's $16 and some odd 32 cents a gram, and there's like 26.9 grams to an ounce and 16 ounces to a pound, I didn't really do the math on that one, but that's a lot of money. So then if you think of it in our real world, which is the black market. So when I mentioned earlier that it's 307 million that our state brought in, by which our state is projected to be number one in marijuana sales by the year 2020, is that um, when we talk about black market, because we have recreational, which is for sale, we have the black market, and we also have medicinal. So 
Like I said, less than 10% of dispensaries pay taxes on the marijuana sales. So everything they're getting is cash, just like our recreational right now. So what we're seeing is on the black market, you can get an ounce of marijuana for around uh, $200. Um, back in uh, the late 90s, I was buying marijuana for about $1,600. But I was getting a really screaming deal because I'd buy lots of it. So when you think about if I'm selling, if you're able to buy marijuana for less than two thousand dollars a pound at eight hundred pounds, that's a lot of money that this person did not claim on their taxes. And so that's one of the heartaches that we're seeing. The heartache is is that Liquor Cannabis Board is now in charge of cannabis. Before they were in charge of liquor sales and tobacco. So in Washington State, there are about 18,000 liquor establishments that sell liquor. There are 6,000 tobacco establishments. And now we add on 2,000 additional processors, producers, and retailers. So Right now, Liquor Cannabis Board is comprised of a total of 134 personnel from the chief on down. They are a regulatory agency, so they just make sure that people are running the business appropriately. So there are exactly, of the 134, 80 of them are investigators. Of those 80 investigators, we're asking them to do just about 24,000 businesses a year. And we're asking, how are you going to do it? Because if you ask law enforcement executives, they weren't doing a very good job with liquor establishments as it was. So now you've tasked them with all this. And now you're seeing all the monies. So just kind of a breakdown of what I found uh, for the monies is that uh, $76 million of that 307 is from excise tax. And the sales tax was $25 million. So... How it's dispersed quarterly, and uh, Senator Becker probably would know this more than I would, but Department of Social Health Service, Healthy Use Survey, gets about 125,000 quarterly. Uh, Department of Social Health Services cost benefit gets uh, 50,000. University of Washington, to do the study, gets 5,000. Liquor Cannabis Board gets $1.2 million. That's quarterly. So. When we talk about businesses, right now we have approximately 334 retail businesses in the state of Washington. As of July 1, all the dispensaries will become illegal, which is a great plus for us. The reason is, is because now they have to be recorded. When you have a medical, or a medical card now, you go there and you actually get a discount, and I don't think you have to pay taxes on the medicinal marijuana. Um, later, I'm going to add a plug that uh, as uh, executives, uh, law enforcement executives along with the county prosecutor, we're going to issue every dispensary a notice that they will be charged for operating a dispensary after July 1. So we want to give them plenty of time to know that. But in the state of Washington right now, there are 1,700 business applications for an additional 226 licenses. So most, all those people, 1,700 of them, still manufacture marijuana. And according to uh, the Northwest Highway executives, um, who actually do the real work, they don't believe that uh, they will be able to fit all 500 because of the restrictions on how to get a business license, which means you cannot be a convicted felon. And so you're having a lot of issues with how you can get a business license if you're a convicted felon when you're selling a uh, controlled substance. Now, uh, being able to sit for the HIDA board also is kind of interesting because um, when we talk about marijuana, um, we're looking at how do we federally prosecute people who are doing large amounts of marijuana. The unfortunate part is in Thurston County, we've just had two <coughs> shootings in the last year that involved the sale of marijuana. Two fatality shootings. We've never seen that. We don't ever see fatality shootings that involve marijuana sales. And we're talking small amounts like ounce deals. Small deals that we're seeing. And 
it, it's what we're seeing, unfortunately, is a future of um, how marijuana is dealt with in the state of Washington because of how it's handled by money. So when I'll talk about money, how it's handled by money is, is that there are three, actually they're all credit unions. Uh, New America Credit Union, um, Salal, uh, S-A-L-L, S-A-L-A-L Credit Union, and the third credit union who's been really helpful is OB Credit Union, is now taking money. They report that the amount of money that they take in on average a week is between five and 25,000 per business twice a week. So that's pretty good business. The unfortunate part that um, when you were talking about um, how we can do like the lemonade thing about our kids and uh, you know getting them to understand business. The unfortunate part about the marijuana industry it is cash. So we're figuring that of all the retailers, and I've got two minutes. Do I get to do questions? Okay, after the two or before? Okay, and this two, this doesn't count for our conference. So anyway, what I want to say is that we're seeing that um, even the retailers right now are not reporting their incomes, and they're making a lot of money. And so we're figuring that right now, all businesses combined make about $1.6 million a day, is what we're seeing. And the sad part is, is that all of you have employers, and you pay their medical, and you pay into their Social Security. Um, in, the in the marijuana industry, they don't pay any of it because federally it's illegal. So the federal government isn't involved in that. So what it is, is about education. Um, and where we're at is prevention and education with our youth. Uh, no, no offense against the adults, you make adult decisions. But the concern I have is for our children and our future. Uh, we know that the children's brains do not develop till they're 25. When they said, what are the effects of how it affects a teenager? They say apathy, disrespect, laziness. I'm going like, those are all teenagers, right? I don't, I don't even know what we're talking about. So when they say that, I go like, I can't read all that because that describes my two kids, right? So, so what I'm saying is, is that it's really hard to tell what the effects of marijuana are on our kids. But if you are a parent, please pay attention to what your kids do. And if they want to try something like that, the best thing I can say is it's not worth it. It's not worth it as a young person. And then the question I'll have is, well, what about alcohol? Well, I wasn't old enough or around when they made it legal, and when they didn't make it legal, and then they made it legal again. And when people compare marijuana to what, and she's telling me it's done, but when you compare marijuana to what it was back 2,000 years ago when they used it for all these great, these great things, rope and clothing and stuff, that's all great. But marijuana is not marijuana of the past. It's future. So what I'm asking you to do is, is uh, with our kids, we need to protect our kids, <coughs> our children, our youth, um, because we want them to grow into healthy, strong adults, and then they can make their own decision. But until then, let's stay on top of that. But having that, I'm told I'm done, so any questions? <laughs> So, okay, so Dusty asked me about the oils. So when we're talking about concentrates, um, so concentrates go between 69% and 76% uh, effectiveness. So, so instead of smoking it, you can either dab it or you can um, use it in uh, concentrates. So it's about the average, we're saying the average, um, is about 74%. So real quickly, uh, what we are seeing in uh, Washington State right now is since he brought it up, is that we're seeing a lot, of, we've seen 17 butane extractions uh, in the state of Washington last year. And what it is is that you're breaking down the plant into a liquid form and it takes heat and butane is highly flammable. And then you also have to burn off the butane so it even becomes more flammable. So that's why we're seeing the explosions and those explosions are not illegal.
those butane extractions are, have not become illegal yet. Um, so that's something that we'll be working on with the legislature to make sure that it is illegal to do a, a extraction like that uh, because it's very simple to do. So um, I would like to say that uh, um, I wish I could say that marijuana use amongst our youth is going down, but it's not. Um, right now, uh, it's against the law to have Washington marijuana go outside of the state of Washington. Well, we've been able to trace it to 43 other states. So we do know it's getting out there. So that's the sad part. Uh, the reason why, real quickly, and I'll answer your question, uh, Councilman, is that Colorado, the reason why Colorado's doing so well, just to let you know, because there's no state east of that state that sells marijuana legally. So that's why they're seeing, uh, that's why there's more money over there right now. So, and Alaska and Oregon just made it legal. So, Councilman Hearn. Where's the best place to track drug-related fatalities? Well, we are starting to do it. We are starting to do it in law enforcement. So real quickly about drug-related fatalities. Okay. Specifically traffic. For traffic. So yeah. what it used to be is that law enforcement, we're all, if you've been in a drug unit, you do know how to detect other drug on, onboard drugs. But if you haven't, and you haven't been to school for it, which is an 80-hour course to be a drug recognition expert, it takes many hours of continued use to do that, um, and it's very expensive. But to be able to detect it, uh, at first we weren't, because it was easier to do a DUI than go do a blood withdrawal, because for us now, to do a person for who we believe is under the influence of marijuana, we have to fill out a form, they have to go to the station, we have to know they haven't been drinking uh, alcohol, or intoxicants, if you will. And then we have to take them to a hospital and do a blood withdrawal. But to do that, we need a search warrant. So, yes, sir. Uh, but we are starting to track it. So if this, uh, America, the laws that are governing this marijuana situation, is it, has it dropped from federal and just came down to state now? Well, the federal has, has been staying out of it uh, for the last few years, um, especially since She's telling me I have to stop. Okay. So if I can't answer anybody else's question, it's her fault. So uh, the feds have decided not to enforce the laws. That's the direction they've been given from the United States Attorney General, and uh, that comes directly from the president. So yes, they have been told not to enforce. Um, however, they have said that if we have something big, uh, especially if it involved uh, violence, that they would consider taking that uh, at the United States Attorney, uh, Assistant United States Attorney's Office. And the reason why I see it so we talk about drug cocktails out there on a large scale. Right. So I know that she told me to stop, and I know it's somebody else's turn, but I do want to mention a couple more things. And you can ask Dusty to talk about this later. Is that in this, in this county right now, uh, methamphetamine is still the most highly abused illegal drug that we're seeing not only in this county but in this state. And then we have the opioid uh, heroin problem that we're seeing. And uh, to be honest with you, we're seeing that wreck havoc on our youth as well. So um, what it takes is us being educated about the use of illegal drugs and how are we going to work together to fight that. And that's what I would say for all of us is that we all needed to work together to stop this, especially for our kids. So anyway, thank you very much for having me. I apologize for the